today's program, without further ado, <laughs> um, claiming our full community, multiracial families and identities in Japanese America, focuses on the cusp of the roughly 1.3 million strong Japanese American community becoming majority multiracial. Today we will talk about the great diversity of multiracial families that constitute Japanese America, the history of multiracial Japanese Americans, including those who were incarcerated in the World War II camps, anti-Blackness and other forms of structural racism within the community. Our panel today, we're honored to have um, fellow co-chair of Sudus for Solidarity, Duncan Ryuken Williams. Um, Duncan Ryuken Williams is one of the co-chairs and a Soto Zen Zudis priest and the chair of the USC School of Religion slash director of the USC Shinto, Shinso Ito Center for Japanese Religions and Culture in Los Angeles. Williams is the author of the LA Times bestseller, American Sutra, A Story of Faith and Freedom in the Second World War, published by Harvard University Press in 2019, about Buddhism and the World War II Japanese American incarceration. Also, The Other Side of Zen, published by Princeton University Press in 2005, and editor of seven books, including Issei Buddhism in the Americas, American Buddhism, Hapa Japan, and Buddhism and Ecology. He is also the founder of Hapa Japan, a mixed race, mixed roots Japanese community and festival. He's the found, he was the founding executive vice president of Hapa House LA and serves as a national steering committee organizations uh, ranging, from, <laughs> ranging from the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History, the Japan Foundation, and the Harvard Pluralism Project. Please welcome my friend, uh, Duncan Ryukin Williams. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Tsuya, and welcome everybody to this morning's uh, conversation. Um, uh, so the format for today is that uh, we have three uh, uh, presenters, uh, 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 myself, uh, Curtis Takata Rooks and Corey Lin. I'll be introducing them uh, uh, just before they speak. And we've all been assigned about uh, roughly 15 minutes to uh, present some information to you and then uh, we'll be in some conversation. We'll, we'll receive some of your comments uh, and questions uh, before going out into a, bre a breakout session uh, prior to a final uh, kind of uh, get together uh, where we, where we take on more of your questions. And so in terms of format, we're gonna each take about 15 minutes to present some material and then um, uh, uh, please uh, send us questions in the chat uh, along the way. So in terms of my bit, I'm going to try to share this screen and, and, and talk, uh, talk through a, um, a PowerPoint uh, type of presentation. And um, the title of my um, kind of presentation bit is called We Have Always Been Here, Mixed Race or Mixed Heritage Japanese Americans, 1868 to 1945. And I, I'm only doing that kind of like uh, historical bit because I think uh, Curtis and, and Corey are gonna give some excellent presentations about uh, more, uh, more current times. But uh, I talk about the past because uh, I think in this current moment in terms of Japanese America, we tend to think about uh, Japanese American futures. Uh, in the 2010, 20 census, we won't know that data obviously until next year. But uh, what we've been seeing in the last two censuses is, is that, uh, first of all, Asians, uh, and then uh, closely followed by Latinx uh, 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 as a kind of ethnic group are the fastest growing in the United States. And that multiracial, uh, so-called Asians in combination, that's when you check more than one box, is growing faster than Asians alone. And so in terms of the Japanese American community, uh, from the 2020 census, so for the first time you could check more than one box, we see this uh, uh, great rise uh, each time the census is taken uh, in the number of Japanese Americans who report themselves as multiracial. It was 35% in the last census, and if the numbers hold in 2020, we expect uh, that multiracial Japanese Americans will be right about the 50% of the 
roughly 1.3 million Japanese Americans, uh, making it the first Asian American community to be uh, majority multiracial. But my point today is that that this multiraciality, as opposed to the monoraciality of the Japanese American community, has always been present uh, from, in fact, the very earliest of uh, the Japanese American experience. I think many of you may know uh, that the first Japanese uh, came uh, uh, in 1868, so called Ganen Mono, Meiji Ganen, or the first year of Meiji, 1868, was when the first uh, of contract laborers. Uh, began to come to Hawaii. And uh, one of the main things about the early Japanese American community is that if you think about that period from 1868 to about 1907, uh, which is the so-called gentleman's agreement, kind of uh, first major restriction on immigration of the Japanese to the United States, uh, about 87% of those who immigrated were men and only 13% were women. Uh, in other words, the so-called picture bride era after 1907, where there's a loophole in the law that allows women to come to the United States as uh, wives of, of men, uh, that is when you have this big rise, about uh, 14,000 women goes picture brides to Hawaii, a little over uh, 10,000 to the mainland uh, United States. And so what does that mean? It means that if 90% roughly of your community are men, it's more likely than not that those who remain and settle and become form something called the Japanese American community. Because we have to remember uh, more than half of those who came to the United States, about 200,000 came uh, from 18, 1868 to uh, 1940, uh, 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 sorry, 1924, then half of them returned to Japan. So the ones who settled and kind of formed the first Japanese American community tended to marry, because there are no Japanese women, they tended to marry people who were not Japanese. And in fact, among the first Gannemo, uh, they, almost all the men who re remained, most of them returned to Japan, almost all of them, the men married Hawaiian women. And so the very first formation of the Japanese American community as a community that was more than men uh, involved multiracial uh, families. It was the same thing when it came to the continental United States. The first uh, main uh, uh, movement of Japanese people to uh, the mainland US uh, was in 1869, the following year. And they formed a community called the Wakamatsu uh, Tea and Silk Colony Farming near Colma, California. And that group from Aizu Wakamatsu region uh, uh, was led by a German, uh, John Henry Schnell, who was a arms dealer for the Wakamas Kali on the wrong side of the Boshin War. He brings about 25 people with him, including his wife, Japanese wife, Joe Chanel, his first daughter, Frances, who was born in Japan. And uh, when they settle and create this uh, colony to grow silkworms and tea, um, the very first Nisei, in other words, the first birthright citizen of uh, the United States of Japanese ancestry, is born to uh, John and Joel and Mary Chanel. So that's one of the things I also, also like to point out is that the first Nisei, it's not just about futures, but first Nisei, in terms of first Japanese American, in terms of birthright citizenship was uh, somebody of mixed race. The other thing about this colony was that amongst those who, again, not everybody remained, many of them went back to Japan. Amongst those who remained, uh, some married uh, uh, local uh, people who were uh, of, of non-Japanese uh, heritage. Uh, so for example, uh, Kurinosuke Masumizu married uh, Carrie uh, Wilson. She was the daughter of a former black slave from Missouri and a Blackfoot Indian woman and a resident of, of Coma, California. And in the 150th anniversary celebration of the founding of the first settlers of Japanese ancestry in continental United States, the descendants, the Yonsei and Gosei, in other words, fourth and fifth generation generations, uh, descendants of that, that uh, uh, marriage uh, uh, attended that event. And so, uh, in other words, multiplicity in terms of what types of uh, combinations of people are getting married uh, and being part of this multiracial Japanese American history, it's, it was present there from the very 
uh, earliest of, of, of times. Um, in terms of contribution to the Japanese American community life, one person I always like to think of is this person, Fred Kinzaburo Makino. He wrote, I, I like to think of him because he reminds me of my own background. I was born and raised in Japan, a British father, Japanese mother. He was born and raised in Japan, a British father, a Japanese mother. He comes to the United States or Hawaii initially. Uh, uh, his brother goes to Hawaii and then goes to New York and, and so forth. But um, uh, he comes initially uh, to as an immigrant from Japan uh, to serve as a store owner. And uh, he practices kind of informally uh, immigration law and helps all the immigrant community deal with immigration cases. He also then becomes involved in the, in the 1909, sugar, the, one of the big sugar plantation strikes as a labor leader. You see him on the upper right side of that uh, photo on the right. And he founds the Hawaii Hochi, one of the main ethnic newspapers, uh, of Japanese ethnic newspapers in, in Hawaii in 1912. Uh, and he ultimately ends up doing a lot of things with the labor strikes, uh, other later plantation strikes. He also is a major contributor to this uh, uh, lawsuit around Japanese language schools that goes to the U.S. Supreme Court, the 1927 uh, Tokushige versus Farrington case. Um, his brother also uh, does a citizenship test case when he's stripped of U.S. citizenship because of, of being half Japanese. And it's a, a case that goes up uh, in New York in 1898, and it uh, presages uh, the Ozawa case, the 22 Supreme Court case. And so Japanese American multiracial persons have been involved in community life uh, uh, in that type of way as well. But they also face some challenges as well in terms of how marriages and these multiracial families could even be legally uh, recognize. And this is because there was a long-standing idea of the purity of the white nation. America is a kind of essentially white, you know, Christian nation. And so uh, I think we all know about anti-miscegenation laws in the South, the, uh, that they are primarily about, uh, you know, protecting the purity of the white race from black Americans. Um, uh, but in the West, almost all of the anti-miscegenation laws passed get framed in terms of this mixing with Asians. And so uh, California is 1850, Oregon 1862. Uh, Washington State is the only one in the West uh, that doesn't have one of these anti nation laws. Uh, there's only eight states in total that didn't have uh, one of these. Um, and so the background to this would be people like this guy, Joseph Cheney saying, you know, the offspring of a white man or and, and Japanese, um, or a white woman, you know, the half breed will never be a man. Uh, it'd be a mongrel insult, neither white nor yellow, neither man or beast. This kind of uh, type of thing about preventing intermarriage with Japanese people uh, was the impetus behind it. And people who, uh, uh, like uh, Lothar uh, Stoddard, who wrote this bestseller, The Rising Tide of Color, he also pointed to uh, this danger of the white world the white race as being threatened uh, uh, by what he calls the teeming colored races. And he says there's no immediate danger of the world being swamped by black blood, but there's a very immediate danger that the white stocks may be swamped by Asiatic blood. And so a lot of this then connected to this purity of the white race thing connected to immigration law. Uh, and uh, so people ended up, this is a certificate of a mar marriage uh, on the left of the screen that's uh, uh, in Spanish. And the reason is because people sometimes have to go to Mexico to get married. This is the marriage certificate of Dr. Fustaro Nakaya of the LA Japanese uh, Hospital who married a white woman, Edith Morton. And uh, so that's their marriage certificate from uh, Mexico in 1921. As I mentioned, Washington State was a place where they didn't have these laws. So some people would go up to Seattle to get married. And then you also see uh, the other form there, the Cable Act 1922 stripped uh, American women who married aliens ineligible for citizenship, mainly meaning Asians. And so she lost her citizenship uh, by marrying a Japanese person, she became a non-U.S. citizen as well. She had to go to court. This is her certificate that re-naturalized her. Uh, uh, it took her uh, until 1936 to do that. And so that's the type of uh, challenges that multiracial marriages and families uh, uh, faced. Um, oops. 
how do I do this? There we go. And I want to end with the war. Uh, you know, we know because we, you know, in pseudo for solidarity, I think most of us have studied the forced removal, the indefinite incarceration, unjust deportation, family separation of World War II. What we might not know as much about are that mixed race persons were also required uh, if they had so-called 1 16th Japanese ancestry uh, to go to these camps. They would uh, take, you know, like for example, from Alaska, uh, uh, people of uh, part Japanese, part uh, Alaskan Eskimo uh, uh, heritage and put them in Minidoka. They put, they rounded up mixed race children from these orphanages. Uh, Carl Bendiston, uh, the so-called chief architect of the uh, mass incarceration, uh, right-hand man to John, uh, DeWitt, uh, he, when he was asked by a Catholic uh, father at the Marinol Orphanage in Los Angeles about whether the mixed race children at the orphanage needed to go into these camps, whether they were subject to Executive Order 9066, he said, I'm determined that if they have one drop of Japanese blood in them, they must go to camp. So that's the uh, type of thing. And so you find uh, at, at the Manzanar Children's Village, which is where the orphanages from various orphanages went, uh, quite a few uh, mixed race children uh, who ended up there. Um, there were some people who were exempted from this. This is a black Japanese family uh, uh, from uh, 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 before the war in that picture. That's 1939. You see um, uh, the children of Genevieve Beckham Kinji and Ke Kenji Inamoto. Uh, Inomata and, and, and their children. And, and there were some exemptions made to mixed race uh, families in this case, because the father served, had served in World War I in the, in the United States uh, military. And so they made some exemptions for those who had served in the military, if you were in these mixed race uh, marriages. And the last person I'm gonna just, last slide here is that, you know, in terms of Japanese American history, uh, we know, of course, during World War II about the 100th Battalion or the MIS and the European Theater and the Pacific Theater. But there were uh, those of many different backgrounds, half Japanese, half Filipino, half Hawaiian, half Portuguese, who, 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 who uh, participated in these uh, efforts as well. Uh, Virgil Westdale, his original name was Nishimura. And he, had, he went to court to try to, he got kicked out of the military when Pearl Harbor happened. And he... Uh, because he was half Japanese. And then uh, uh, he ch legally changed his name to Westdale, Nishi, Mura. Nishi means West and Mura means village, but he calls himself Westdale. And, uh, uh, but then, you know, he's half Japanese, half uh, Caucasian. He ends up uh, serving uh, uh, valiantly in the 442. Um, but uh, uh, this, I, I, you know, he's, he's still alive at 100 years old. And I, I wanted to end with him because of that idea that we have always been here. In other words, there are people who are 100 years old, who um, uh, are of multiracial Japanese American history, who've been part of this history for uh, quite a long time. And uh, let me just end there uh, uh, and um, uh, now turn it over to uh, uh, Curtis Ricks. I'll, I'll stop sharing the screen. And uh, now I'm, I'm gonna have uh, Curtis Takada Rooks, uh, who is an assistant professor and program uh, coordinator of the Asia Pacific American Studies at uh, Loyola Marymount uh, University. He teaches courses in APIA multiracial identity, transpacific diaspora, and contemporary APIA community issues. Uh, his teaching also includes short term study abroad programs in Japan, and his research uh, focuses on Asian American multiracial identity. Uh, examining the role of multiracial Japanese Americans in U.S.-Japan relations, and he's spoken widely uh, on multiracial Japanese American issues. Uh, uh, issues, and I would highly recommend his uh, TEDx uh, LMU talk uh, that's on uh, on YouTube, uh, uh, where he talks about uh, those type of issues uh, in a TED uh, talk. Um, he also has a lot of engaged scholarship uh, that uh, includes participatory community-based research uh, based on cul uh, cultural competencies, community health and wellness, ethnic community development, and university and college persistence and retention. Uh, he's the lead uh, author of a uh, 
major study, a 400 page study uh, called Global Nikkei Study uh, that uh, funded by the Nippon Foundation and the Japan American National Museum. If you don't want to read the whole 400 pages, there's a nice summary of that on the Nippon Foundation website. Uh, in January, he'll be joining the board of the US Japan Council. Um, uh, my uh, colleague uh, across the way here in Los Angeles, uh, Curtis Takata Rooks. Well, good morning. Um, I'm so excited to be here today. Um, but, you know, they said I had 15 minutes and, well, I'm the grandson of an AME preacher and 15 minutes, we can hardly introduce ourselves. So if I, if I start preaching, forgive me. Well, not really. You don't have to forgive me, but that's what's going to happen. So, but, you know, and, and listening to what Duncan shared, I, it, it, it sort of transitioning and sort of these two historical pieces, you know, um, that sort of the notion of sort of uh, that brings us to this conversation with BLM and this sort of racial injustice now. And as the Japanese American community begins to talk about those sort of things of anti blackness, it's almost as if the black community is somewhere over there and we're not somehow part of that community. Um, but as the history tells us, one of the first uh, so Issei families, their first Nisei were black Japanese. Um, when uh, um, he talked about um, Kuninotsuke, uh, who married uh, Carrie, um, they had three children, right? And so, so when we begin to sort of think about, so what are the stories we tell ourselves? What in the Japanese American, American community were the stories that we tell ourselves about who we are? What are the stories we tell ourselves about blackness, right? And oftentimes those, those are separated. And the other thing from the historical piece that he was talking about were sort of the, the um, marriages between Japanese men and Alaska natives. Um, in my dissertation, I actually did a study on Asian Americans in Alaska and traveled around to villages throughout Alaska, um, interviewing a lot of uh, the Eskimo children of those marriages. And one of the things that was fascinating when I was doing that was they would show me family albums and the father would be dressed in Eskimo um, attire and the Eskimo mother would be wearing a kimono. <laughs> um, and so uh, these men became uh, great leaders in, their in the communities there and, 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 and the like. And uh, um, so anyway, so this, this notion of um, families sort of intertwining their cultural backgrounds, finding those places where their cultural backgrounds connect, where they complement or where they supplement. Um, I'm of the generation that came with the military and international brides between 1949 following the war and so when they call it the sort of war brides period to 1965, but we know that still continues on. But that population that comes in the 1950s is the the largest major cohort of migrants from Japan. Remember, Japanese migration pretty much gets cut off in 1924 and doesn't really kick back in until after 1965 Immigration Act that opens up uh, more fluid um, migration. And so the only migration we get between those times were some Kibe who were able to come back after the war and sponsor in other family members, um, as well as these military international families. Now I talk about this as family because they did not come as individual women, they came as members of families. And when they came to the United States, they got nurtured by a variety of different communities. Sometimes the Japanese American community when they married Japanese American men. In the case of my mom, she was nurtured by the black community. She was taught to be American by African American women, strong African American women. And so she came up in the 60s as a community activist, working with Japanese, with, with African-American women as they began to sort of, uh, sort of challenge, uh, sort of play it, sort of participate in the civil rights movement. And they would raise, they would do fundraisers to raise scholarships for African-American kids going to college out of our local high school and everything like that. So and she, she became a Grand Worth Machin in the Eastern Star, which is a major, a fraternal organization for women in the black community. She was a secretary treasurer of the Pilgrim Baptist Church, which is a black church in Manhattan, Kansas. And so you see that sort of the ways in which she lent her cultural, some of her cultural practices to the black community and, and, and similarly, they, they sort of 
lent it back to her. And indeed, even her English had black slang in it. For instance, um, you know, when something tastes uh, bitter, like greens or something would have a bitter taste, she would always call it, say, it has this evil taste. Well, growing up, as she told me about this evil taste, I thought evil was Japanese. About 30 years old, I came to recognize what she was saying was evil. Because <laughs> in, 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 black, in black culture, something's bitter, it's got an evil taste to it. So anyway, that, beside, that aside, one of the things that I think is really interesting for us as we look at this, and, and I guess what I wanted to share today, was that in this particular time when the, the, the notion of discrimination is heightened, about the black community. The story we begin to tell ourselves about blackness is, is certainly and importantly the discrimination that they face. But we fail to also tell ourselves the stories about the notions of resilience, resistance, activism, all the richness, the oral culture that they have, the oral history that they have, the oral culture that I grew up with, that paired with the oral culture in Japanese society. Um, and, and sort of how we come to know ourselves. And so, um, and so one of the things that I, I think that we, we sometimes miss in these sorts of, of crisis times is that we look at the people instead of people, right? We look at the black people and how we can help them instead of looking at people and many in your own community, right? like me who are black Japanese and, and the like. So, you know, when I, when I think about um, sort of the ways in which um, those of us of mixed background have uh, been able to participate or have participated in the Japanese American community. Um, and in some sense, the group of, and sort of the academic group of mine we did, a, we did a lot of the first groundbreaking work on mixed race identity, whether we're talking about the work of Christine, Christine Ijima Hall, a, a black, psych, black Japanese psychologist who wrote one of the first dissertations that sort of began to talk about it, or the work of Stephen uh, Murphy Shigematsu. Um, also, um, he is a, a, a Irish and, and Japanese descent, or George Kitch, or Michael Thornton, who is of black Japanese descent, who talks about sort of the ways in which military culture, Japanese culture, and black culture sort of intertwined in these families, um, and how sort of the various parts of those cultures um, uh, complement each other and where they overlap. You know, in my family, the things that overlapped are, in a sense, were this notion of um, respecting elders, right? You respected elders. That came from not just my mother but also from my father, right? This whole, the, the notion that seniors were to be valued, um, their stories they told had rich, lear rich learning for you. Um, the value of wisdom and education came from both sides of my family. Um, I, I remember living with my grandmother in Wilmington, North Carolina. There was a time when my father was serving in Vietnam and my mother was in the hospital. So, we, so my, my paternal grandparents, took my brother and I in, and we lived with them in North Carolina for a year. And we're, this was before the Civil Rights Act too, so this is early 60s. Um, and they nurtured us, right? They, they, they wrapped us around. And so growing up and understanding sort of my blackness was there. I mean, I, on that side of the family, descendants of sharecroppers and persons who were enslaved and all that culture and all that richness was taught to me and, and from them. But they also valued education. I remember I came home with an unsatisfactory on my sort of cursive handwriting and my grandmother sat me down. She, she was the tiger mom before we knew tiger moms and I had to sit there before I could go play for an hour and a half recopying all my notes until I got went from a U to a to a whatever the acceptable A type of uh, marking was. Um, there is the ones who taught me that reading was as valuable that was the most important thing that I could do. In fact, if you think, think about it and you look at the black community, reading was something that they valued. It was so valuable to them that they passed laws during enslavement so that they couldn't be taught to read. You could get whipped and beaten if you learned to read and those who taught you to read could go to jail. 
right? So when we talk about sort of the role of trauma, historical trauma over time, the black community has a whole lot to teach us about how do you deal with intergenerational trauma, intergenerational trauma that tried to steal your identity, that tried to steal your humanity, that tried to steal your value of wisdom and, and learning, that's taught, that tried to steal, you know, it all, steal your families, right? And yet, one of the things we know that after, uh, the, after the Civil War, almost all the movement that happened were people trying to reunite their families, right? And which how they, uh, and many guys ended up being caught for vagrancy loss because they didn't have a place to live because they were trying to reunite. There were networks where they could, they could, they could find out a child that go, got sold away um, at birth or when they were little. So understand that sort of, there is lots that we can learn from the black community about this notion of intergenerational trauma and the way to persist and to resist, right? One of the sort of um, things that and during this BLM movement that's being talked about is like, there's no group that has loved America more, believes more in America's promise than black folk. We have always fought for it. We have always pushed for that notion of, of, of meritocracy, that notion that all persons are created equal because we knew we weren't treated that way, but we knew in our hearts that we were. There's much to be learned. I think, you know, as someone who's an Asian American scholar, we look at, and, and your next uh, um, uh, session, the fourth session is gonna look at the parallel more closely, but, you know, we were nurtured intellectually by Fa France Fanon, by the writer France Fanon, W.E.B. Du Bois, um, in our sense of uh, activism, Malcolm X, uh, Martin Luther King here in LA, James Lawson, and sort of issues of, of labor and other things, A. Philip Randolph and Bayard Rustin, um, and then in literature from Langston Hughes to Maya Angelou. So these are all the folks who inspired and, and, and gave us language to articulate, articulate sort of ways in which we can deconstruct sort of white supremacy, deconstruct the the white supremacy, sort of the white supremacy in the academy, deconstruct all these various forms of cultural hegemony. So I, I, I guess I, I want to sort of um, end my little part today is to say that um, my reason for wanting to speak today, to wanting to share today, is so that the Japanese America that my daughter grows up in we want that's not only accepting, but is nurturing. Inclusion is more than welcome, but we have to be engaging. We have to be engaging and nurturing. And in doing so, I believe, I firmly believe the community can come to its full sense of wellness, its full sense of health. Because if we exclude those who are part of the family, we'll never be whole. And so, um, and I, and I, and I, and, and, and if she chooses for her children as well. Now, for my own daughter, she's carving her own path. Um, Mariko is her own force of nature, and, and many in the uh, Los Angeles Japanese American community knows that already. But, um, but I guess um, in closing, I would just just like to say is have us sort of reflect on. So, what are the stories you tell yourself? Thanks so much, uh, Curtis. As always, um, uh, uh, wonderful insights. And we're going to try to talk together in a moment. Uh, you mentioned Mariko, your daughter. I think uh, uh, she has such a wonderful, great perspective uh, as well. And in a way, uh, Curtis, uh, so that uh, it's not just uh, older people like me and you, uh, we have next up uh, Corey Lynn. Uh, to kind of represent the younger generation and uh, not just the multiracial uh, Japanese American community, but the multi heritage one. Uh, Corey Lin is a Midwest based Japanese Taiwanese American illustrator and designer, uh, specializing in portraiture, uh, watercolor, food illustration, and culture centered storytelling. Uh, by visualizing uh, narratives and illuminating concepts, she makes art that fuels action. 
Her work has been published in the LA Times, either Chicago, WBEZ, uh, uh, Curious Ch uh, City Chicago, and Twin Cities Daily Planet. Uh, Corey organizes uh, in her Asian American and Japanese communities uh, with Nikkei Uprising, uh, taking action in Chicago for collective uh, liberation. She is invested in unpacking our country's trauma and privilege to build power for all the next generation. Um, uh, Corey uh, uh, Nakamura Lin. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Corey Nakamura Lin, and I am repping the Midwest, um, among many other things today. Uh, I'm calling from the lands of the Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi people, now known as Chicago. Um, and I wanted to use this time to share my story and to share some of the thoughts that kick around in my head as I live as a mis mixed ethnicity, but full East Asian person. So I'm gonna go ahead and share a little presentation I have for you. Also, yeah, thank you everyone. I have seen people from Chicago and Minneapolis and uh, Bay Area today. So thanks y'all for coming out. Okay, this is me. So I wanted to start with this quote that um, I actually adapted from the gender theorist Judith Butler. Um, their original quote is, to be a woman is to become a woman. And um, that's kind of the idea that like when we're born, we have our bodies and the way that we look, but that's, that doesn't kind of build our identity. Like you learn what that is over time. And so I've adapted it to, to be Asian is to become Asian. And I think that summarizes a lot of the themes that I wanna talk about today. Um, and uh, I think also what uh, Professor Rooks was just saying is like, yeah, like what are the stories that we tell ourselves? And that's a huge part of um, what I wanted to talk about. So wanted to start by telling you a little bit about me and my family. I was raised in the suburbs of Chicago to an upper middle class family. Both sides of my family, the Taiwanese and the Japanese got along really well, which is um, I think something a little surprising if you know anything about Taiwanese history. Um, but here's a picture of some of my cousins and my family on both sides. Um, this is my Japanese family on the left. Um, there's me. That uh, on that side, I think I I'm gonna go back because I didn't uh, change the subtitles. But on that side, a lot of my aunts and uncles were uh, had interracially married. So my cousins are both Japanese, Okinawan, white, and African American. And then on my Taiwanese side, uh, my dad and his parents came over in the 60s. Uh, so they're kind of first generation and my, my dad and his uh, siblings married uh, Japanese and Taiwanese people. So we're Japanese and Taiwanese on that side as well. Yeah, so that's me. But growing up, I always felt more Japanese because I was uh, raised as a part of a Japanese American church in Chicago um, that my grandparents went to kind of after internment and then my mom went to as well and then uh, met my father there. So I was raised really in the community and went to Japanese American church camp every summer um, that there were a lot of people who were Yonsei, lots of people who were mixed, Filipino, Chinese, um, white, uh, mostly. And so being a mixed Japanese person was very common. When I went to school in the suburbs of Chicago, um, there were a lot of first generation or first and second generation East Asians. And so even though we shared a lot of identity, um, me being Yonsei, I really felt very different from a lot of those uh, people that I went to school with and felt a lot of internalized racism to distance myself from them because I didn't want to be seen as a fob. Like, you know, fresh off the boat um, and feeling like I really wanted to prove myself as an American. Oftentimes people would be like, oh, what languages do you speak? And I would be like, I just speak English um, because my parents had decided not to uh, teach us Japanese or Mandarin or Taiwanese. So, um, oh, yeah, and that is me as well, getting into a little bit of a more questionable appearance phase. But my mixed heritage began even before my parents. Um, here is the, my Nisei on my Japanese and Okinawan side. My grandmother, Patsy Hisako Ige, was Okinawan. Her family came from Okinawa right at the turn of the century. I think even before um, Japan had 
colonized Okinawa, so they were they weren't even Japanese when they came to Hawaii. And uh, that's my grandfather, who came from his family is from Hiroshima, and uh, he was raised in California as a Nisei as well. Um, my grandfather was later interned because he was in California, and that really shaped um, the way that he saw himself as an American and um, how he raised his children. So. By the time that my mom and her sisters were born, um, they were really established. Uh, the Japanese Americans were at that point established in Chicago area. Lots of people had come through internment and then gone to Chicago. Um, they were raised in the suburbs at this point and had kind of like gotten to middle class status. Um, and if you can see from their names, my mom is Donna Louise. Um, my aunt and uh, my both my aunts have they have very American names, and I think that that was kind of a part of uh, my grandparents really establishing themselves as American. And by this time, they did not identify as Okinawan; they only identified as Japanese American, if that. So this is me and my siblings, as well as my cousins, and so you can see that uh, we're the Yonsei. Um, if from our names, we, my mom at this point had decided that she really wanted to make sure that we carried on the legacy of uh, being Japanese. So me and my siblings all have the same middle name. Um, for the most part, we were not raised to really know our Okinawan heritage or differentiate between that, even though all of my cousins and I are Okinawan. Um, my cousins are all in California and were raised there at this point. So that had a really different um, impression of how they were, uh, came to their Asian-ness as well. And also that um, one of my cousins is mixed white. His dad is um, English and German. And my other cousins are also Japanese and African-American on their father's side as well. So we are all mixed JAs. And me and my sisters are the ones who are full um, racially Asian. So this is kind of how I would identify on a government form. My race is Asian or Asian American. My ethnicities are Japanese and Taiwanese, and my nationality is American. Um, and I wanted to highlight that this is how I identify in forms because that is the for me race is a really is a political category. It's something that has been created um, over time, in, and it has a very unique place in America, um, especially the concept of being Asian like as a thing. It's like there's West Asians, there's Southeast Asians, there's South Asians, like all of us are from all over. And, uh, but in, in the US, we really group ourselves as being this, this one thing, um, which is Asian, even though it's like a whole continent. So um, basically, I don't think that these categories really help me translate who I am. And um, being a East Asian, but multi heritage person, these are some of the things that um, the kind of traditional categories of race, race, ethnicity, and nationality um, bring to me as being, these are like complications. Um, that's what the exclamation points mean, that it's kind of like, ah! So um, I'm gonna talk through a few of these today. I will just also say that like on forms, I don't identify as being mixed race. I will always just write down Asian. So um, first of all, mixed people are whole. Like even though we're, we share different, have come different heritages, like I think I grew up being like I'm half Taiwanese, half Japanese, or half Taiwanese, a quarter Japanese, a quarter Okinawan. Um, but I think that now in my conversations with mixed people, it was the understanding that like, we're not our percentages. We're not kind of these pie graphs in ourselves. Like we kind of come together and you can fully be a part of, I'm a fully Taiwanese person and I'm a fully Japanese person. Um, in the same way um, that we are whole in our whole bodies and the stories that we carry. The next one is that um, sometimes our appearances um, can be different from the identities and the heritages, cultures we hold inside of us. And so that passing or being perceived as a certain race or um, a different type of ethnicity um, can also influence the way that people treat you too. And that's not something that can really be captured. Um, in kind of the race, ethnicity, nationality boxes. Um, the next one is identity as clout, identity as currency. And um, this one is a little bit more complicated. And I would say I come from, um, I'm a millennial, I'm 28. 
Um, I work in a lot of organizing spaces and art spaces where the culture tends to be very, I don't know, let's say like counter that of what in like white American professional society is. And so within the spaces that I'm in, it's very much now a powerful and a preferred identity to be um, BIPOC or black indigenous person of color. Um, and so I didn't even identify as a person of color until after college, because until then I didn't have a lot of experience with interracial solidarity. Um, and I don't think we talked about that when I was growing up. I was always just Asian or Asian American. So that's something that I have opted into now, like now I fully identify as being um, an Asian person, of, uh, being within the person of cat color category. But now sometimes those have kind of become a preferred Space where I'm kind of seeing it shift the way that um, people identify themselves. Like when I was a child, it was always preferred to be white. And so I would downplay all these things about myself. Like saying that I could only speak English was me being like, no, look, I'm more American. Like I'm like all of you, my white peers. Whereas now um, I feel sometimes not really, but I feel like shame for not knowing Japanese or Mandarin um, because it makes me less Asian. And now I live in a world where being really proud of your culture and your non-white identity is something that does really celebrate it. Um, so that is something that I'm seeing shift to, especially amongst mixed people where we have a lot of control around how we represent ourselves. Um, white adjacency is something that I also don't see talked a lot about in when we are selecting our own identities. Um, this is where I'm trying to kind of like assess my responsibility in this kind of global racial reckoning that um, uh, uh, we were just talking about. Um, the way that I speak, uh, the fact that I have a bachelor's degree, that I'm light skinned, I have like kind of professional experience, like that all shapes the way that I'm perceived in society. Um, and how I'm seen, like how I have basically, yeah, like adjacency to whiteness, also in having white family, I have a lot of white access. Um, class, I think also influences that as well. Um, for example, when I was in, working in Minneapolis for a long time, there's a lot of nonprofit people who would want to hire a woman of color artist. And so me being a woman of color, they would always like want to give me jobs and kind of like in a like, yes, like we're helping women of color. But then I also have to do a lot of self-reflection and being like, well, in terms of like the whole range of what being a woman of color is, I have a lot more adjacency class status um, and privileges than other women of color do. And for a white person um, who is looking at me, they're not seeing all of that. So it's kind of on me to a, a figure out if I'm actually the person who should be taking these gigs. Um, so that's kind of a, more of a concrete example of that. And I will just name that, um, like within white adjacency, this stereotype of like a white man being with an Asian woman is something that like I grew up really entrenched in. Like it doesn't, it does, the fact that many Japanese Americans are now not married to another Japanese American is like someone said in the comments, entirely unsurprising. Um, and I think that it's, it, yeah, like that stereotype doesn't exist in a vacuum. It comes from power dynamics and the histories um, that we were talking about as well. And so like, I felt the pressure of that a lot growing up and also the um, almost, oh yeah. I will say that I grew up in a time when interracial relationships were not as vilified as ban or banned as they have been in the past, or at least some types of interracial relationships. Um, and a little bit more of being kind of like fetishized. And I say that in a way of being like, that the uh, Asian and white couple has come to mean something that um, is like a symbol that's a little bit wider than like the actual couple themselves. Like, I mean, my family, there's a lot of um, like interracial relationships as I've talked about, um, but we as a society or like in media and like movies, we tend to use the interracial white Asian couple to like prove something and sometimes it means progress, but without kind of unpacking where that comes from. Okay, and so then the final complication that I have is kind of this like, what even is nationality though? Um, so like for my nationality, it's American because I was born in the United States and I live here now. So that kind of makes sense to me. But then in my head, Japanese American is an ethnicity. But then if I go back a few generations, Japanese American, like they were colonizing the Okinawan, which I also am. And to now like, 
both the US and Japan are still um, opening a lot of like holding a lot of the land in Okinawa for military bases and whatnot. So in some ways, to be Japanese is also to identify with a nation state. Um, and so like, I feel like if we can all go back far and like, this is where my tagline that I first put up comes from, like, we're all mixed to some degree is that like, all of our races and even our nationalities have been formed over time. Like Japan wasn't always Japan. Like at one point it was a lot of different identities and cultures put together. And then it was like the nation state that made it Japan. So what does it mean for me to identify with that nation state and to pass that on? Um, I think all the time, like if I have children and then they, we use up all the resources on earth and the next generation has to like go off into space, like will they be earthlings? Will they be Americans? Will they even be Asian? Like what will that mean when we have to go to a new planet and there's a whole new social order? So, I mean, those are just some of the things. Um, so here's kind of where I'm sitting in, and this is where um, I, I'm going to kind of close out, is so those are just like a, five of the big concepts that are kind of really hard for me to grapple with on the day-to-day, -day. and so I kind of soothe myself by asking me these questions. Um, it's not what am I or um, how do I present, but it is who are, what's my culture, what's my people, what's my power? So what my culture, what are the stories that I want to pass on? Um, what are the traditions that I want to pass on? What are the values that I really want to hold? Um, for my people, it's like, yeah, who will I fight for? Who will I fight with when we're fighting with others? Um, where will I use my power to hold the line? And who will I really care for? Um, and then finally, um, for my power, it's what does the positioning that I have and the privileges that I have, how do I leverage that um, in the right way? So like, what are the, the rooms that I'm able to get into and how can I use that, that power um, or that, that entryway in order to make the world better for everyone who might not be able to get into that space? So like for me, because I went to college and then um, have a lot of like nonprofit experience, like I have a very high tolerance for white nonprofit bullshit. And so, oh yeah, sorry, mom, if you're watching this, but like if there's often times where I've had friends of color who have to leave spaces or leave jobs because it was just like very, very toxic to them. And in those times I kind of have to hold of being like, could I also be like, oh yeah, like, yeah, like screw this place, like they're racist. Or is that then my responsibility to be like, as someone who has a really high tolerance for this, like, can I hold this down or can I make improvements from the inside? Um, so, that's kind of just um, some of the ways that I am, am breaking this down inside of myself. Definitely trying to have more conversations with, with others about this. I'm seeing a lot of resonance happening in the chat. Um, so I'm gonna end with this quote again, and to become, to be Asian is to become Asian. Feel free to fill in that blank with any or many of the identities that you hold, um, but just to show that these are choices that we are making and we are passing on to the future, both as individuals and as um, kind of a society as a whole. So um, definitely looking forward to talking more and digging into some of these questions, but thank you so much for giving me the space today. Corey, fantastic. And, and people appreciate your illustrations as I do, as do I. Um, so uh, Lisa Doya, if you're listening, please give me uh, uh, warnings about time uh, if, if the three of us are going over. Uh, but um, you know, this is a moment when uh, Curtis, uh, Corey, uh, the three of us I think can maybe start to uh, tackle some of the questions that have come in the chat uh, throughout the course of the morning. Um, maybe I've just been looking through them and maybe one of the places we could start, uh, Corey, you had that little chart towards the end of your slides uh, about negotiating. And then I think you had like negotiating my culture, negotiating my people, my, my power. Um, there's a set of questions that were asked. Um, one that was uh, specifically put to, to, to Curtis. Uh, uh, but I think it kind of applies to everybody. And, and, and then Stan Shikuma asked a question that was kind of uh, 
related to that around these kind of negotiations of identity, identity formation, and that kind of thing. So maybe we could just start there. Um, from Zara Espinoza, there was a question, says, Dr. Rooks, uh, what are the most prominent ways you've had to flex slash adapt to being a black Japanese American? Uh, have, how have these evolved over time? And anything you'd encourage folks to avoid and or to continue uh, to, to practice when approaching and embracing intersectional identities. So that's the, that was put to you, Curtis, uh, directly, but um, something that maybe, Corey, you and I can also think about uh, in terms of that question of uh, negotiating or flexing or adapting. Um, Stan Shikuma had an associated question. He asked all of us, uh, can, what was it? Uh, can you talk about the pressure, if any, to choose one cultural slash ethnic identity uh, over another. Any challenges to a unified or bifurcated identity? And so um, those were, I thought, slightly interlinked questions uh, that have to do with this idea of negotiated identity that has, uh, I think we would all agree that identity formation is not just you choose something, uh, but that sometimes it's negotiated through how people perceive you. Uh, Corey had some great points about perception and passing, all those type of things. So I will just throw it out to the two of you, however you want to answer it. I, I'll, I'll try to tackle it as well. But uh, uh, Curtis or Corey, do you, who wants to go first? Corey? You know, I, it, since the first part was sort of uh, placed to me in terms of um, these negotiations and what, what identities you privilege and where, um, as someone who has has grown up as black identified throughout most of the United States, sort of, I'm never not black. Even when I'm in Japanese American spaces, when I'm in Japanese spaces, the closest time I come to not being black is when I hang out in Hawaii. Um, and then they think I might be, anyway. So, <laughs> um, until I open my mouth and don't speak pigeon very well. So, so this, this notion of, um, uh, looking at sort of performance and sort of how we perform our race uh, and, and negotiate. And I think for me, um, I've grown up in, uh, in Kansas, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Texas, Okinawa, Japan, Alaska, I, and, and, as a, and as an adult, lived in New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, Alaska, and California. So um, depending on the community that I'm in, and I feel freedom to, to be able to um, uh, sort of mold into or flow in and out of the various communities. When I'm in the Japanese American community, I understand sort of Japanese American culture and, and those sorts of things. And I speak to participate in and perform within those markers. When I'm in Japan, I do the same. Um, on occasion, um, depending on the sort of issues at hand, certainly I will, will then allow sort of the, the broader richness to be sort of engage in, in that conversation. Um, but I'm never ashamed of who I am. I never hide who I am, but, but can privilege um, uh, one over the other. And sometimes I'm just a Midwest Kansas farm boy. Thank you, Curtis. Uh, Corey, yes. any thoughts? So, okay, I think I am, there's a lot of questions, but I think I'll, I'll answer the one about if I feel pressure to identify one way or the other. And um, I think, or how I negotiate that. Um, and I feel like this is different as a like not multiracial person, as like a single ethnic person in the Midwest. Like I have lived most of my life just being Asian. And that is like very acceptable to, to most people. Um, and being able to dig into these kind of deeper ethnic ethnicity culture questions has been more new to my life in my like later adulthood. Um, I will say though that I do feel often time a, a stress of not having enough time. Like I know that there's a lot of ways that we can choose to be a part of community and as a mixed person that it is valid that I am a whole in all of these identities that I hold but also like I have a really limited amount of time. So for the past few years, I've gotten really involved in the Japanese American community, especially in Chicago, um, and have spent a lot of time like learning about those histories and telling those stories. And that feels like that is a choice on my part um, to do that versus in spending time with my Taiwanese American identity. Um, 
same with my nibbling. My uh, sister's child is mixed uh, white, Jewish, um, Taiwanese, Okinawan, and Japanese. And now um, we spend a lot of time being like, ah, like, how are we going to embed all of these cultures and stories um, within her tiny two-year-old body? Too. And so that's something where it's like, of course, she, like she's going to make all the choices that she wants for her life. But as we're kind of sharing our history and heritage with her, knowing that it's a, it's a lot to, that we are whole beings, but our time is finite in terms of how much engagement we can spend within a community. And so I think for me, it's just like making, I guess, um, like holding that reality and knowing that I can only spend um, time in the, the movements that make me feel like I need them, like what is healing to me. And I think oh, in a lot of ways, reckoning with the Yonsei legacy has been the most necessary for me in my life thus far. So that's kind of where I've spent some time. You know, um, you know, while I've been in California, I've spent a lot of time in the Japanese American community go to a Japanese American Christian church. My wife is Japanese American Sansei, and I spend a lot of time with a, a, a Sinchin Buddhist church here in, in Los Angeles. Um, and yet, as I said, um, I'm never not black. Um, in these recent sort of uprisings, um, my col um, I went to Dartmouth College and, and our class ha had a reunion year. So they called on me and I've been able to sort of um, lead a series of conversations on sort of race for my classmates, and mostly white. Um, but we were able to, a group of us, uh, black alumni, were been able to bring back into the fold a number of black folks. So in that particular space, I am certainly privileging my blackness. My Japanese-ness at that point is something that's known, but it isn't emphasized, at least at this point. Um, and yet, at other times when I was when I went to college there, my mixedness was what I was. I was mixed, not black or Japanese. I was mixed, um, and um, so that. And, and I guess sometimes when I, I sort of say the things that I say, people say, "Well, what about the bad stuff? What about the times that people rejected you and all that kind of stuff?" And yes, there were rejections by the black community, rejections by the the Japanese community. I had mothers who told their daughters never to come come back home. If they decided to stay with me as in terms of dating, I've had, you know, all that stuff, right? And not to say, but I refuse to take on this notion of being a tragic model. Tragic stuff has happened, but I do have a choice in how I respond to that, right? And how I sort of deal with that. And so, um, and I've been lucky enough to have a support network around me that allows me to, 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 um, what was it you said, Corey? Uh, um, deal with, deal with shit. So, um, my mother's not listening. So, um, but my daughter might be. Oops. So, but but in the sense of, um, uh, she's twenty one. It's no problem. But but in the sense of, you know, we all have to claim a space, right? And we all have to perform in that space. Now, for me, it may be a little bit tougher that I don't get accepted at face value. Um, and I have to sort of, there's, there's a proving piece in there, but I think that happens to everyone new to a community at some point. Mine just happens when I knock on the door except instead of two weeks later. Thanks, Curtis. I, I've been given little messages uh, from the organizers that uh, we're, we're about uh, 30 seconds out from the end of this first session where we're gonna go into breakout rooms uh, to discuss these matters in more depth, and then we'll come back, and, and Curtis, myself, and Corey, we'll, we'll come back and, 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 and we'll continue this discussion. There's some great questions in the chat about uh, white adjacency, some definitions around that, and there's some great questions. So we're gonna come back to all those, uh, plus any more that come out from the breakout room. So I'm gonna turn it back to uh, Tooth for Solidarity organizer, uh, uh, Lisa Doy. Hi, thank you so much to our amazing panel. You've 
been really wonderful and I'm excited to come back and continue to hear from you. But before we do that, we're going to open up breakout rooms for a few minutes to allow our participants to get a chance to connect with each other. Um, so we're offering two questions for these short breakouts. The first is, what is one thing you've learned from this conversation? And what is one thing you'd still like to learn more about? So I'll put these questions in the chat. Um, please consider them while you're in your breakout groups and you will be brought back here uh, for some more Q&A with our panel in a few minutes. So thank you all. Welcome back everyone. I hope you had um, a good time in your breakout sessions. Um, before we jump back into our panel, we're going to hear, we'd like to hear back from maybe one or two of our groups. Um, so if anyone wants to share something that you talked about, um, feel free to raise your hand. I'll try to find your face amongst all the Zoom squares or raise your hand in Zoom. Um, and we will love to hear back from one or two groups. Margaret, from our group, please share. <laughs> Done. Okay, Megan. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Megan. So we, we had a really nice conversation sort of about um, sort of started off with this idea of wholeness really resonating with our group of um, several of us were, you know, mixed and sort of that idea really resonating something we wanted to explore a little bit more and um, ended up talking a little bit about sort of our culture and like how we're kind of embracing or passing on um, aspects of kind of Japanese American culture within our families. Um, and so it was just a really nice way to connect and sort of reflecting on um, the comfort in sort of being around people who kind of understand those elements, certain, certain elements of kind of shared experiences or, or culture was, was really nice. Thank you so much. I see Shoshana has her hand up. I was just going to say that uh, the uh, members in the, our group uh, were great and they, uh, Kelly and Amy and Lindsay actually all made comments that, I, that we should share. Yeah, they were great. Thank you. Um, anyone, Always those key comments right as the, rooms, uh, the breakout session ends. Yeah, thank you so much, Shoshana. Um, anyone else want to share from their group? Okay, well, I will ask if anyone wants to continue sharing questions or comments to please put them in the chat and I'll hand it back over to Duncan and our panel for some more question and answer time. Okay, great. Um, uh, feel free to keep on sending uh, questions and we took some time during the break to uh, think through a few um, uh, of the questions and kind of put them together. There was um, some questions uh, I think Miko Yoshida asked about uh, things like the model minority myth, uh, imposter syndrome, these kind of questions around um, uh, assimilating resistance assimilation. Uh, there were questions around white adjacency, what's the definition of it, uh, uh, how, how is that uh, best to be understood, uh, assimilation and survival, things like that. Um, so. I'm going to take that to be a kind of like a, I call it the karma of, of being American, but like what we inherit uh, uh, in terms of what those who've gone before have uh, uh, brought down to us. Um, I wonder if Corey or Curtis, you'd like to uh, maybe touch on these, these uh, type of questions um, uh, from your perspective. Um, I guess I'll go ahead and lead off. Um, you know, I teach critical race. And so when we look at sort of um, notions of anti-blackness and sort of sort of some of the sort of racist things that are there, you know, if you if if you have grown up in the United States and you see a black person and there's some fear there or that there's some anti-blackness that goes there, the only thing that means is that you're alive. You you've been taught from the jump 
sort of these racial stereotypes, these, these feelings about race and the things that they are, right? You, in a sense, um, psychologists and neuropsychology said you, that neural pathway has been burned into you from all of your, all of your sort of agreed reality learning, right? And everywhere that you go. So your first thought, that first thought of, of, of fear or apprehension or questioning and those sorts of things, you can't help that. That is just going to be the response that, and that fear response, fear or flight, flight response. But your second thought you do have control over and how long you hang on to that first thought, right? And so, you know, being anti-racist or anti, um, uh, anti-sexist, anti, uh, uh, um, anything that has to do with sexuality in this country is very difficult. And, it's, and an analogy I would use is a moving sidewalk. Once you're on it, it's going to take you, if you do nothing, it will take you to that end of white supremacy, of, 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 of patriarchy, any of those sorts of things, right? In order to fight against it, depending on sort of what's happening at that time, you have to turn around, walk in the other direction, and have to at least get enough, exert enough force as the, as the moving sidewalk just to stay still. To be anti, you have to exert more force than that sidewalk, which is really hard work, and it's constant, right? The moment you slow down, you lose ground. And so what I would say to you is that we're in a, we're in a very difficult fight, and that in order to sort of do those things, we have to know it's a long haul, give ourselves some grace for the times that we get tired, but know that it's not going to be one event, one activity, one workshop, one conversation, one book club. It's going to be a cumulative effect because you are you're having to shed and burn a new uh, off and off lot to burn that new neural pathway. Thank you so much. I think that that kind of like it hits a lot for me. Um, because that's kind of like the experience that I feel like I am living and in the process of trying to do. Like, um, I think uh, Duncan called it kar like karma, but I feel like it is also in another way, generational trauma, um, the trauma of living in a, the United States, which is racial, like racist colonial slave state, you know, like all of those things that kind of like bleed into us over time. Um, and I think that, as some people were saying is that like oftentimes uh, becoming white adjacent is a survival tactic for that people of color have been employing for for generations and um, I, in many of the ways I kind of bemoan the assimilation that my Japanese family and my Taiwanese family have participated in but knowing that that was the choice that they had to make at that time um, and that the only thing that I can do now is know that I can be that I have all of the experiences and knowledge that they had plus more um, and also I have social media. So I have like all of the, like I'm connected to a global network of information that my father never even had. Um, and that I feel like my generation is really trying to do a lot of things of trying to grapple with the, the things that we both suffered and the choices that we made through that suffering. Um, I'm thinking about how Japanese Americans um, stopped their children from going to HBCUs um, back during internment and how um, during reparations they put a block um, or they wrote it in a way so that it would not be a standard that um, African American or Indigenous Americans could use to get their own reparations as well. Like those were choices that we made over time um, in order to try to solidify our place. And I have the benefit of being in a position now where I do have all of those things that they sacrificed for. And so I think I, me and my community and at least my siblings and I, I feel like we're trying to use the tools that, that were sacrificed and hard fought for um, and now to kind of turn back on our histories and find ways that we can um, embed that in our greater communities as well, not just our Japanese American. I want to go to a se second set of uh, questions um, that had to do uh, in part with code switching. Um, uh, I think it's in reference both to things like linguistic code switching, which is do you toggle back and forth between 
uh, different languages, but also I would imagine whether it's religious code switching or cultural, like there are other forms of, of code switching I, and it links to some of these other uh, comments in the chat about, uh, and I think the, there was a, who was it, uh, Megan or so, so, somebody from the groups said something about this issue of wholeness. Uh, and what is the, I, I think there, there's something interesting about what is the relationship between the idea of wholeness and the idea of code switching? I wonder if uh, either of you want to tackle that. Corey, could you go first? Yes. Sorry, I was reading the, some of the really good stuff in the chat. Um, but yeah, I will say, like, like I said, I feel like a part of my white adjacency is that I don't code switch. Like this is how I talk like most of the time, um, even to my friend, even though I use different slang and stuff um, is that I, and I see that too is like in the, the generational sacrifices that have been made of my family. Like we came to a place where we sacrificed a lot of our language um, in order to become accepted in white America. And, um, and that's another part of my white adjacency is like, I grew up in the suburbs. Like this is kind of just how I talk. Um, so I will say that I see, like that is kind of a part of my acknowledgement is that I, I see a lot of people my age now taking on um, black, Latinx um, terminology, phrases, culture, like, I mean, even all, like Curtis was saying, the water that we, that we exist in in America is anti-black or like that's kind of the, the culture, but in some ways the media that we absorb is also from black culture. Like hip hop culture is pop culture. All the slang that we use, at least in my generation, all of it originates from like black trans queer people from like 20 to 30 years ago. So I think it's, um, I mean, just thinking about language and how we use it, I feel like a part of me sitting in my white adjacency is not adapting those terms that could get me more cultural clout, like Yas Queen, like things that are like, it's lit, like, you know, things that people say in marketing now to sell things um, and acknowledging that those don't come from a space that have been, like, we're not giving the money to the people who made those terms, so I shouldn't be a part of, um, using and co-opting that language as well. So, sorry, I don't know if that's exactly what you were speaking on, but that's kind of my take. You know, when I think about something like code switching, you know, so I can hang in the Black community and speak in ways that are spoken there. I can hang in the white community. I don't speak with a glaring Japanese or Black accent. Um, and I know a little bit of Japanese and can get in and out of Japanese, but I also cult culturally code switch as well. Now, one of the things that people try to, I, I think one of the, the errors that happens sometimes, which are wrongheaded thinking, is that code switching is somehow duplicitous, or that if I have to code switch, I'm somehow giving in to whatever those things, the other pressures are. When I code switch into Japanese American culture and speak and more, Japanese cultural language, I do it because I am Japanese, <laughs> not because I'm trying to fit in it's in that necessarily, but that is a part of who I am. I'm both and, right? And so when I'm in that space, all of us, when we're, we're in communities that we're at, one of the reasons we're there to get our, our sort of our needs met, whether they're physical needs, psychological needs, just loneliness needs, whatever it is. And so we speak that language. If, that, if, if that's a part of who you are. When I'm in the black community and I wanna get things done, using Japanese cultural language probably won't allow me to get it done. And when I use black cultural language in the Japanese culture, it will probably not allow me to get things done. So I, I see that code switching, um, if people wanna try to sort of um, throw shade at me for code switching, I'm just not gonna accept it. Right, because that's what I need to do. And when I'm in, when I'm in Tokyo, and I need to find my way someplace, I'm certainly not going to ask for directions in English. So, it, I guess what I'm saying is that we live a complex life. It for those of us who are mixed, we have access to these various different codes, and we can shift in and out of them as as fluidly as we breathe. 
you know, so if I had a superpower, and it's not everyone, I mean, we had the potentiality. If you grew up in a really funky family that didn't teach you those things, or you grew up in only one community that may not, you may not have access to it, but for those of us have, right, that's my superpower, right, Marvel. Um, so, so, you know, but it, it's this thing that um, I will never apologize for code switching. And I, and I don't hold it against the other folks to whom I'm code switching that I have to. Sometimes it's our white dominant society things, maybe. But even then, you know, I've been an administrator. I was associate dean for nine years at, at College of Liberal Arts. I was associate dean of students for eight years at a, a smaller college, at Pomona College. If I wanted to get things done in that environment, guess what code I needed to, what cultural language I needed to speak? White, male, administrative, academic language, right? If I was going to get the things I needed to get done for the students that I wanted to, to help. Thank you, Curtis and, and Corey. So um, I'm going to say a word about code switching, and, and, and I'm going to try to also give a kind of synthetic uh, view uh, uh, to, to end my remarks. But maybe while I'm doing that, Curtis and Corey, if you could think of something you'd like to, as a kind of like, as we, uh, you know, I think we have 13 minutes left, like uh, as we come to the end of this morning session, is there one kind of message or idea, especially for those people in this audience today for whom these type of conversations may be relatively new, if you have a message for them, what would it uh, be? Uh, so think about that. And in the meantime, I'm just gonna say a word about code switching. Like, so I grew up in Japan and raised in Japan. And so Japanese was my first language. And I think I was 13 when I went uh, to the UK to uh, a boarding school to, to, to my, I think my British father thought my, you know, English was so bad that I needed to be immersed in that. And, 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 you know, certainly that's kind of where I started to learn that things in the UK work differently than how things work in Japan. And so some of the, you know, things that I still do that my, wife sometimes makes fun of it's like i'll be on a phone so you know cell phone with somebody in japan and then i'll be speaking in japan and then i'm bowing or something and she's like they can't see you <laughs> you know uh, but it's a it's it, it's somehow i feel that they might be able to somehow feel my deferential speaking or something so i feel like especially those of us who have came up with two languages or what like and, and no different grandparents, et cetera, we will, as Curtis was saying, code switching is very, very natural. And so I wanted to end uh, as a kind of just a th thing is that there are many, many ways of negotiating these type of questions. Uh, code switching is sometimes we call it situational identity formation, but based on your situation, your identity stuff shifts and changes is, is dynamic. And that's the kind of nature of being dynamic. Um, it, uh, and uh, I wanted to just end with a thought about like the multiplicity of ways we negotiate belonging. All right. So number one is that situational thing. Number two is the opposite of that foundational identity formation, which is like when you have multiple things going on in terms of your heritage or background or some people say, you know what, I want to just choose one. Curtis mentioned earlier, I'm both and like, but some people don't choose that as a tactic. Right. And some people say, I'm just going to choose one. And that kind of uh, essentialist or foundational way of uh, surviving in the world is also a perfectly acceptable way of doing things. Uh, so that's foundational, then there's situational, and then there's integrational. There's some people who just don't like the code switching thing where they have to present different pieces of themselves primary. And so they're like, I'm gonna find a way to integrate all these different things, my different religions, my different, whatever, and they just, have this integrated identity that presents the same everywhere. Uh, that's a third tactic that some people like to use. And then the fourth one, uh, the, these are the four, I would say, big ones, is transcendentalist. Like, you know, you just say, I'm a Muslim or Christian or uh, I'm a human being. Like some people just say race is an artificial, you know, it's made up, nationalities are, borders are artificial. So people can sometimes transcend, make that transcendental move. That's also another move that people make. And there are actually four, or five, there are other, moves that people make. And what I've noticed is that if you've lived, I'm in my 50s now, and Curtis is, I won't mention his age, but where, 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 once you've lived some decades, I think most people recognize if you're 
come from multilingual, multiracial, multi whatever it is, religion, that, that probably you've tried out all four styles at different decades of your life and that that's okay. And that you might even had to try out more styles than that. But you might have one that fits you more and, and, and you just figure that out as you go along. So that's kind of where I'll end. And I'll turn to uh, 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 Curtis and Corey to, to uh, add their final thoughts as well. Corey, after you. Great, thanks Curtis, thanks Duncan. Uh, I think just that I am really happy that we're having this conversation together, like reading the chat has been giving me life, um, that I feel like these are conversations within Japanese American community that I did not think that we would be having, especially nationwide. Um, and I feel like that that is, we're in the process of shaping our cultural story of what it means to be a part of Nikkei community in this era right now. And um, like I said in my speech, it's been very helpful for me to think of it as being choices that I can make no matter what age I'm in. Um, right now, me and my sisters are learning Japanese, like katakana, like very basic, um, but we're doing that as a part of our um, Re reclamation in a lot of ways. And so I think I invite everyone to be able to reclaim parts of our identity, to look into the choices our ancestors made, um, to shape what we do in this moment that it feels really important um, to be thinking about community as, as wider than people who look exactly like us, which I think makes sense to a lot of the people with mixed heritage here. Um, and also that like we can really shape what it means to be Japanese American for the next generation, which is what I think about like every day. So um, I hope that you all are doing well and we can keep doing this together. I think that's awesome. Um, one of the things that's been fun for me on this is to actually listen to Corey um, and many of the younger folks that I get to work with, I'm, I'm blessed because I'm at a college, but sort of their, their ability to take the, the theories and other things that we've worked on and, and have a language to express the, the, the challenges that they face and, and, and the ways in which they overcome them, because I, they're not victims, they're agents in their own, in their, sort of their own becoming. Um, so, you know, what I would love for us to do, leave, you know, I started this with saying, what are the stories we tell ourselves, right? What do we tell stories we tell ourselves about our own self? What are the stories we tell ourselves about others? One of the questions I would ask for the Japanese American community, with whom should we collaborate and why? With whom do we share history? With whom do we share the present? And more importantly, with whom should we share the future, <laughs> right? If our intermixing has anything to do with things, if we even look at the 2010 census, the actual among Asians, the largest percentage growth was Asians marrying into with African Americans or marrying black. So there's these interesting things that are happening dynamic as we stand here, as 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 we're going. But I would would again sort of have us ask those questions, and we will each come to different answers in different ways. And as a community, will we come to an agreement about that? Um, but in 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 doing that. We have to examine a little bit of our past, a little bit of our present, so that we can be intentional about what we want for our future. Um, and so I, I thank you for allowing us the space to pose questions to you, to share with you some of our, our experiences. And, and to be sure, moving forward, there's going to be conflict. But if growing up mixed has taught me anything, is conflict is not bad. Right? Conflict is a part of our is, it complicated is, but we learn from that conflict, we grow from that conflict, um, and we challenge ourselves from that conflict. And that sometimes we're happy with the conflict. Um, and so I just, I just ask that as, as you work in each of your organizations, ask the hard question, and it's okay. Thank you so much to our really amazing panel. Um, Curtis, I don't think there's a better way we could have ended than with that. 
Um, so thank you all again for your time today. Thank you to everyone who joined us to watch this amazing program. Um, I really just appreciate sharing this space with you. Um, you know, some of the things that I think are sticking with me where we started with Duncan talking about how multiracial Japanese America has always been here. Um, Corey affirming that in our multiracial and multi-ethnic selves, we are whole. Um, and Curtis talking about the need for nurturing community. And so hopefully these were themes you felt in this space today. Um, and hopefully these are themes that sort of undergird and guide our work going forward. So sort of in that vein, particularly in that vein of nurturing, um, after a one hour break, we are going to um, welcome people back for optional affinity group spaces. Um, so these are sort of uh, identity-based spaces uh, where we'll have more chance for people to really explore their own multiracial or multi-ethnic experience, the experience as parents of multiracial or multi-ethnic children, as well as space for people who identified um, as you know, I, either just as Japanese American or monoracially Japanese American. Um, so if you've already registered, um, you should have gotten information about uh, how to get into those spaces. If you have not yet registered, please email tsuduforsolidarity at gmail.com. I'll also put this in the chat in case you want to read it. Um, and if you can't make it but want to stay more involved uh, in our affinity group work, there's also a form uh, that I put into the chat that has um, information about how to stay involved in this. I want to put in a, another plug for our final program, which is on October 24th. Um, it's being led by Satsuki Ina, and it's picking up on some of the questions we've talked about today around anti-Blackness um, and questions of Japanese American and Black American histories um, sort of from post-World War II to now. Um, you can learn more and register for that program um, on our website, um, and I'll also put uh, the link in the chat. So uh, I'll drop in the link for that registration. Um, and then sort of outside this community conversation series, uh, Tsudu for Solidarity is also doing a few other things, but one that I want to plug right now is our get out the vote work. You know, across the country, we're in a period where early voting has started in, in every state. Um, and we really want to encourage our whole audience and Japanese Americans across the country to get out and vote this year. Um, so we have um, some special videos that we're, we've already released and we are continuing to release talking about the importance of voting. We have special Tsudu Votes um, origami paper, so you can fold a Tsudu Votes crane. Um, and we'll also have two text and phone banking dates to encourage Japanese Americans to get out the vote in partnership with Apala and JACL. So if you want more information about any of those things, we'll send a dedicated email soon, but you can also check out our Tsudu Votes website. And that's in the chat as well. And then finally, I just wanted to plug two partner events, community events that we thought our audience might be interested in. Next Friday, October 16th at 3 p.m. Pacific time, uh, the Japanese American Confinement Site Consortium, along with the Japanese American Memorial Pilgrimages, the Heart Mountain Wyoming Foundation, Sudu for Solidarity, and the Asian American Psychological Association are co-hosting a program called Community Healing, Revealing Our Secrets. It's being led by Shirley Ann Higuchi and Satsuki Ina, and really comes back to some of these ideas that we've talked about in this presentation and in previous presentations around intergenerational trauma and healing, um, and the, sort of the power of uh, storytelling in that process. That program is going to be live streamed on the Japanese American Memorial Pilgrimage's YouTube page, uh, which I'll put in the chat. But if you want to participate, you don't need to register. Just go to that YouTube link um, on October 16th or afterwards to watch the program either live or the recording. Um, and then the final plug I want to make is for uh, this year's Den Show annual dinner, which is now called Dinner at Home. Um, so it's this year, it's free and open to the public. But our friends at Den Show on Saturday, October 24th, are having their annual dinner. It's typically a, you know, a very big fundraiser for them. Um, and the work that they're doing um, is, is as important as ever. So we really encourage you to attend their annual dinner. This year's theme is Together We Can, and it's an intergenerational celebration of Japanese American community. The keynote speakers, uh, Valerie Kaur and Bryn Saito, will talk about how Valerie's Sikh immigrant grandfather helped Japanese Americans during World War II, and how this led to a lifelong friendship between their two families. So we really encourage you to attend our program on the 24th, to attend Densho's program, to attend the 
the um, Community Healing Revealing Our Secrets on the 16th, there's just a, a whole range of really exciting programs coming forward. So thank you again for coming. We hope to see you at our affinity group space later this afternoon or at our next program on the 24th. Thanks again.